Good afternoon, everyone. Just right. My name is Errol Fabian. I'm a drug addict, and I want to share a little bit of my life with you. Um, most people know that there are two different types of drug addicts. Active drug addicts, people who are still actively using and abusing drugs, and recovering drug addicts, people who have stopped using and abusing drugs. And today, thank God, I'm a recovering drug addict. Thank you. I was born in 1960. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It had hospital and thing too, then days. Yeah. Um, I was born in 1960 to Andrew and Gloria Fabian. My name is really Fabian. From small, I was growing up. When I was in South, I was Fabian. I moved to Port of Spain and I became, became Fabian. So, <laughs> so, for the people from South, I am Errol Fabian. And for the tongue people, hey, I'm Errol Fabian. I am number six of nine children that my mother and father had. I'm also number seven of 11 children that my father had. Yeah, he had a child before all of us and one after all of us. But um, I grew up in Gonzales Village, Guapo. That's not very near to here. But let me tell you, Gonzales Village, Guapo was the best place in the world to grow up when I was growing up there. We had everything, everything. Um, my mother had a beautiful flower garden in the front yard, and we grew everything else that we ate. And we also kept rabbits, chickens, well, any feathered thing that you could rear, we used to rear. <laughs> um, cats, dogs, pigs, goats, and we ate all of the above. Yeah. <laughs> we ate the rabbits, yes, we ate the rabbits. The dogs um, ate each other. We did eat <laughs> And I did eat cat now and again. Uh, I still dabble a little bit in that. But, uh, <laughs> OK, but um, yeah, that was my life. It was good. And my, and my household was full of love. And um, when I went to primary school, I went to Guapo Government School. And my father was the principal. And I was large and in charge. I run things. Things now run me in Guapo School, I tell you. I had a little gang from as early as standard one, standard two. I was, I was real bad news in primary school. You know, um, I wasn't about learning when I was in school. I was about lime, plasticine, comic book, pelting paper, um, everything else but that. I managed to pass common entrance um, using a method that people who hear, who wrote common entrance would you know. Because it was multiple choice, you have to shade the answer. So I use any mini, mini, more shade. <laughs> and any mini shade and more shade. And I would close my and drop the pencil and shade. <laughs> and um, I passed common entrance to Naparima College. And um, <laughs> it was a real big deal for me. I mean, all my other brothers went presentation college, their first choice. And all my sisters went, you know, to their first choice. But I was real happy to go to Naparima College. And I was even more happy when I got there. Because at Naparima College, I graduated from plaster scene and comic book and thing. And I was involved in the combo. I used to sing in the combo, public speaking for the school, Calypso for the class and for the school, drama festival and that. Everything else except what you're in school for, really. Um, but I was good. I was happy that volleyball, football, everything for Naparima College, I was there. And um, well, I left school with no subjects. Um, Daddy wasn't very happy about that. I remember that being one of the longest days of my life. Getting that slip and telling Daddy, it was like about four weeks happened in that day between the two. But I did tell him, and he didn't say anything that day. The next day, the back and I'll start. But um, also at Naprima College, I started experimenting with marijuana. And I recount my first use of marijuana because I have an older brother who was really, really good. I mean, goody, goody. And then there was me. And if he wasn't so good, I wouldn't have looked so bad. But you know, he caused everything, you know? He caused a lot of problems. But he, I love him too bad, and I love all of my brothers and sisters. And um, I started using marijuana. And he didn't have a good experience with it, so he didn't continue using it. But I wanted to be bigger than I was, older than I was. I wanted to be a big man, so I rarely used marijuana. 
So I lamed bigger fellas in the village, and then in school, I discovered it had fellas in Form 6 who was using, so I lamed with them too. I had no time for schoolwork. So when I left school, I had gotten involved in drama in Naprima College under Ralph Mirage and James Lewa, great men in my life. And then I hooked up with Errol Stokes and, and, and got introduced to comedy there. And it was good. And I moved to Tong. I moved to Belmont. And talk about ganja. <laughs> I think if I joined it's like four inches, I'd probably smoke a couple hundred miles of marijuana in my life. I'd be so happy to know that I'm still alive and still sober and still in some way sane. Um, but I ended up getting introduced to television through a company called Banyan Limited, a man named Christopher Laird, who's like the father of television to the English-speaking Caribbean. And Christopher Laird and I met because in 1981, he was doing a documentary, believe it or not, the computerization of licensing office. And um, <laughs> and, and, I, I, and I was the star. <laughs> I was a star, you know, and I had my first TV thing, you know, and I acted in this thing. I went on to do a number of TV things, but some years later, Christopher approached me to come and work on ba with Banyan as a production manager, and as the person um, who would pretty much tote everything and set up lights, I wanted to finish, tear down everything and pack it up and drive the car back and unpack it, you know, and come in front and see what they need and so on before the shoot happens. But I was real drugging in those days. I'd started using crack cocaine. I used to use black joints. I had crack cocaine and mixing marijuana. And I'm a poly addict. I have no particular drug of choice. I would use anything to get high, including an elevator. Anything that would get me up, <laughs> I used to use. So it's alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, crack cocaine, you know. And my day would be filled with all of the above. So when I was working in Banyan, I was sure they were on to me and they would fire me because I used to reach the work late and mash up the company car. I was a real disaster, you know. And when I thought they were going to fire me, I kind of just abandoned the work and went and spiraled, I mean really spiraled downhill with drug abuse and, and ended up, I never left home and I never left the streets. You know, I just ended up there. I was living on a cardboard, but I used to go home and I used to be in front national commercial banking me crazy all the time. And all the vagrants knew me, but I used to go home sometimes, you know, because I have my wife and three daughters there, which is a whole next story. But I remember very importantly is at, at Naprima College, although I didn't leave with subjects, I left it a fire in me. I, I learned to learn at Naprima College. I really, really learned how to learn, and that's what I try to teach my children more than anything else. I don't care how much percentage you get in or what. Once you're learning, I'm happy. Because, you know, this is what has held me. Because I cannot read to myself. I never learn anything from a book. But watching them set up and toting everything when I was working in Banyan, I learned everything about television. And then, well, I ended up in a drug rehab center. Thank God. I didn't want to be there. And a drug rehab center is a place for people who want it, not people who need it. And the one I went to is the New Life Ministries Drug Rehabilitation Center in Mount St. Benedict. And there's a panel that screens you. They see you, they see your family, they see all it together, and then they decide if you could get in. And when they saw me, it was clear that I didn't want no recovery. And every panel has one recovering drug addict on it. And the one who was on the panel, when I was screened, thank God he was there, because he asked them to rethink. He said that this young man, I was a young man then, is an entertainer. And if we could touch his life, he will be able to touch other lives. And that is how, on the 29th day of February 1988, I ended up in a drug rehabilitation center. I did not want to be there. I hated the place. I had no contact with the outside world for 14 days. And every day for those 14 days, I tried to leave. And on the 14th day, they called my wife and asked me to speak to her. And I pleaded with her for me to leave. And she told me, no, stay seven more days. And if you stay seven more days and you don't want to stay, you could come out. The residential part of that program is three months, 91 days. And um, I told her, no, I want to leave. And she, I was threatened that I probably would never see my children again. And I love my children. So I made my first sober decision as an adult at age 27 in the rehab center because 
since the first time in foam tried smoke marijuana. I'd never been 14 consecutive days drug free from then until now. And um, I decided to stay. I finished in 91 days. But while I was in rehab, the three people who hosted that television program, Gael, that I used to be the production manager for, for Banyan, Tony Hall, Errol Sitahal, and Niala Maraji were all leaving the country. And they all suggested that Errol Fabian be the host of Gael. And they didn't know where to find me, but they found me in this drug rehab center and offered me a job to present, to be a TV presenter. That was in 1988 when I left the rehab center. Um, I wasted my time in rehab. And I went to a fellowship called Narcotics Anonymous who told me to make 90 meetings in 90 days. So I wasn't about to take any job. But the people at Banyan, Christopher Led, and they, they're so good, they told me, well, you know, work two days a week, come learn the script, go in front of the camera, you could do that. And you go to the meetings and so on. They were very supportive. And I started off as a presenter. In a couple months, I was writer and presenter. In a couple months, I was director, writer, and presenter. In a couple months, I was producer, director, writer, presenter. And if it was humanly possible to videotape yourself, I'd have been a cameraman, writer, <laughs> producer, director. Because I love to learn, and I learned to learn at Naprima College, and I wanted to become somebody. As a drug addict on the street, I was less than zero, less than a stray dog. People treat a stray dog nicer and better than they treat a drug addict on the street. And that's where I was coming from, and I wanted to become something. And as I embraced my recovery, things started happening, and I started doing the things I dreamed of when I was down there high, wanted to be in a movie. I ended up in, in three different feature films. I had the pleasure of taking my children to movie town and Kate Donner to see Daddy on the big screen. I started my own radio program on mornings. I started a humorous Calypso tent. I started a lot of things. But something very important happened when I was working Banyan, working on the program Gail, that we had this segment called Sprang Alarm. And the people at TTT were very upset when we started it and said to get that monkey off of this TV. And that stayed with me. That really bothered me because he, for me, embodied a Caribbean-ness, a Caribbean experience, a trininess. A, you know, it was real. It was normal, everyday, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, everybody thing we used to talk about in, in, in cultural sprang alarm. And from then, I know we needed to get we own TV. And when the, the contract ended and there was some discussion, I told them, well, let's open our own TV station in my youth and naivety and so on. It was a joke. But it was not a joke for me. It was not a joke for me at all. And I ended up working in the front advertising agencies and always would fight with the account executives because they'll give me a script to go and produce this ad. And I would come back with it and they'd be like, what? You don't find that one too black? You'll find she knows too big, she for too poxy, he had too hard, that one can't talk good. And there's always a set of fight over me using people who look and talk like people who use their products in their ads. And I could never understand why they fight down. So, <laughs> so I was fired up more and more and more. And I remember working on a on a campaign for Republic Bank in the 90s, where they won. It's a campaign they still use. And um, thinking we should lease Channel One on cable and show all this financial thing in the day and in the night, go by Christopher and Banyan and get that Caribbean archive and use local TV in the night. I never got to present it. And it ended up in the hands of a man named Mark White. And he left the agency and he went to the next agency. and. First Citizens was their client, and one day they called me and asked me if I would come and talk them through what I had written because he wanted to present it to First Citizens. And I did, but I didn't want to do that. I had my courts hustling, no courts man, I was in my yellow clothes, and I had a lot of corporate work, I had my radio show in the morning, and you know, things was nice, you know, money was coming, and I didn't want to hear nothing about this thing. That was behind me. You know, the fire was still inside there somewhere. So I went to the meeting, after meeting, after meeting, and then three elections happened back to back in Trinidad, and our society was very polarized. And I called Christopher, because I didn't know yet that he had a, 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 a television license. I found this out in that conversation. And I was saying to him that, you know, we shouldn't give no corporate entity this thing. It should belong to the people. And Christopher is very like-minded with me. And so we started trying to create guile. We couldn't get money borrowed nowhere to do it. So we went out to sponsors, 
and with an eight-minute demo of what the station looked like, we raised $1.5 million in sponsorship. And we bought all the equipment and started Guyal on the 16th day of February in 2004. The people in the industry told us it's not going to last. Some say it will make three months. A lot of us say, oh, you're squandering your good name, your goodwill, don't do this. But I could not not do this. And let me tell you, owning Guile was so easy. Keeping it is pressure. And you can't believe. In the early days, it was nice. We were one of two TV stations. TTT had just closed, and it was TV6 and Guile, and we made money. And we pumped all of it into the station because Christopher and I want to drive no bands and none of them things. We want to train people. We want to tell the story. We want to discover Caribbean television. So we went about that. We started with 25 staff in half of our upstairs of a building in St. James. And in about three years, we were in the whole building. And over 100 families used to get a paycheck from Guile. It was going good. And we were training people. And then the world economy started to shift downwards. And our business model was based on advertising and sponsorship. And those were the things that went first. I remember the Guile News used to gross over $200,000 a month. And we had a big staff that used to consume on almost all of that. And that was in December and January. The Guile News was grossing $4,000. And we had to shift. We had to close the newsroom, take somebody else's news. Keeping Guile alive was very difficult. Right now, Guile is in a room downstairs of my home in St. Joseph. That's where we come live from. And every month, it's difficult. I have just 12 staff on staff now. And if I could trim it, I might want to trim it again, too. Because the survival of Guile is paramount. A lot of people say it's not professional. It's look bad. It's sound bad. It's us. It's us. We want to look good and sound good, but we want to discover Caribbean television. And if at the end of it, it's going to look like American TV, well, that is when it will look so, but not now. Right now, we're finding out what Caribbean television will look like and sound like. But when I'm in the States, <laughs> when I'm in the US, I see local TV. When I'm in Canada, I see local TV. When I'm in the UK, I see local TV. If I go to, when I was in Brazil, I saw local TV. In Egypt, I saw local TV. If I go to China, I'll see local TV. Japan, local TV. India, local TV. Why in Trinidad, I have to see American TV. I want to see local TV. You know what I mean? You tell me, Fabian, too much reruns, boy. Too much reruns on Gael. Well, I will rerun waiting until all is sick of it. Because when I watch the other stations in Trinidad, them rerunning Hollywood. Five series old and three series old series are showing me, and they're re killing me with Hollywood. I will kill Hollywood with Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean. I'm sorry. I make no apologies for it. Gael has a, a mission statement to see the world and ourselves through our own eyes. And too many of us don't know what's going on in Grenada or Caracas. We know everything about North America. And we want to change that in Guile. So all peoples of the world who share our experience, who are developing nations, we will show their content. India, Africa, the rest of the region, everywhere where there's a developing nation, people who share our experience, that's the content that will end up on Guile. It has not become a bed of roses. In fact, this morning, my friends, I was in a meeting with the other shareholders of Guile, people who I think have become despondent. And for the last year, they've been talking about selling it. And this morning, I let my voice be heard. And I tell them my story. I'm a very passionate man. I cry plenty and things, so they have to excuse me. But I tell them this morning, I want Guile. And I made an offer this morning. I'm now 100% owner of that station. I don't know how I'll pay for it. I don't know how I'm going to pay those shareholders for the money that I offered them for it, but I'm going to do it. Because when Errol Fabian set out to do something, he just do it. So I'm going to do it. Some years ago, I was a vagrant. And I never expected where my life was going to take me. I'm a dreamer. I'm the biggest dreamer in the world. But you know what? My dreams come true. They always do. I'm the happiest man in the whole world, you know. I really am. 
And today I'm blessed with seven children and I just became a grandfather last week, Wednesday. And, and when my grandson and my great-grandchildren get big, they will have a chance to work Gael because I am going to make sure that it's still standing and it's available there to them. I thank you very much for listening to me. I am Errol Fabian. I believe in the Caribbean. I believe in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago because Trinidad and Tobago, you all here, give me a second chance in life. And everything I do, when I wake up and I sweat, it has to be for the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. It can't be for Hollywood or anybody else. I don't know how to do that. Today, I'm 24 years, 17 days and three hours, completely drunk free. And I thank you very much.